interview is the man you know and love from Beetle Brunch Radio. Let's hear it for Joe Johnson. Hey guys, thanks for being here again. You guys got here early. You guys got here early. In fact, I think some of you got here on the last Flower Power Cruise and held your seat. Is that right? Because I recognize most of you. Let me give you advice. When this is over, get an autograph. That'd be fun. But you may want to stay here for the next Flower Power Cruise and just hold your seat because that's going to be uh, next March 30th, but it, it's worth it. You might want to hide under a blanket or something so we don't take you out with the luggage, but uh, it would be great. So we're going to have a fun time here for the next uh, 45 to an hour. So thank you for coming. Thank you for getting here early. We're going to talk about uh, the stars and how they made it big and what it felt like to hear their hits on the radio. And we're going to have them out here in just a minute. But the American Top 40 charts really exploded around uh, 1961, 60, when uh, Motown came around and uh, the rock and roll started to filter across. Well, it all started for these pop stars too. And, you know, they were all competing for not just the uh, top 40 slots, but also to try to be number one on the charts. And it was, a, it was a tough place to be, and once you were there, it was like a roller coaster, and it set you on a huge trajectory for many, many years. And um, our stars all uh, made that. They made their way to number one, all of them multiple times at number one. And um, they've reinvented themselves to stay relevant, because a lot of the stars that we remember from 1961, 63 on the charts, they kind of faded from the memory, but these four gentlemen uh, have remained to this day powerful personalities and we've seen them perform on previous Flower Power Cruises and at some of our Abbey Road on the River events. So uh, we're going to bring them out here. They are part of the 60s generation, the Flower Power generation of hits. Uh, first as lead singer of Paul Revere and the Raiders, star in Where the Action Is, wrote many of the hits for Paul Revere and the Raiders. He had number one success as a solo artist with uh, Arizona and the Raiders' last number one at Indian Reservation. He's back for his second tour of duty. Please welcome our buddy, Mark Lindsay. Love that shirt, my brother. Thank you for coming. Love you, love you. He's looking good, man. That's a cross between Jimmy Buffett and the Raiders, but we're in the Caribbean, so it's perfect. Awesome. All right, you know uh, our next guest, and I'm going to start talking about him. You're going to go crazy. Well, uh, as lead singer of the Monkees, they had 12 top 40 hits, including three number ones, five multi-platinum albums, a hit TV show, a movie, tours that set attendance records, the monkey mania was invented, they were there when the Beatles were recording Sgt. Pepper. Our headlining star is joining us for his third Flower Power Cruise, and uh, he'll start with Mark Lindsay later on this week on 50 Summers of Love. That particular show has been running all summer, but it's wrapping up pretty much here on the Flower Power Cruise, so you're going to be some of the last to see it. Uh, you may have seen him sneaking around the ship the past couple of days with his hat dipped low so he could say like he just swam on the boat, but he's been here for a couple of days. Singer, songwriter, actor, director, radio personality, theater director, and of course, lead singer of the Monkees, Mickey Dolenz! Our next guest, maybe you just saw him on the All Access Pass with Jason talking about his early life and his inspiration. Well, you may have heard him on the uh, song back in the day called Peppermint Twist, Joey D and the Starlighters. But if you really want to hear him, break out any Rascals album or CD because he's the lead singer of one of the hottest bands in music history. Uh, he can be heard on such hits as Groovin', Good Lovin', I've Been Lonely Too Long, People Gotta Be Free, It's a Beautiful Morning, and many, many more. And uh, he's working on his autobiography. We were just talking about some of the details that he's going to plan to leave or not include in the book and uh, he also reunited five years ago on the once upon a dream tour with the original rascals anybody have a chance to see that all right awesome he's a member of the songwriters hall of fame the hammond hall of fame and of course the rock and roll hall of fame silver and uh, silver card holders saw him last night at the celebrity theater and you gold card holders tonight at 6 30 please welcome felix cavallari Working man in show business. Good to see you, my friend. All right. And last, but certainly not least, a huge favorite of the Flower Power Cruises in Abbey Road on the River in 1964. 
He fronted one of the biggest bands of the British Invasion. Three number ones in America right away. Songs like I'm Into Something Good, Can't You Hear My Heartbeat, Mrs. Brown, I'm Henry VIII, I Am. Dozens more in the top 40. Uh, Flower Power Cruises, you saw him open up the cruise for us on uh, Saturday night. Please welcome the wildly entertaining, extremely talented, still good looking, still has all his original parts, Peter Noon. What an excitement. Look at this, all these people here. You've done it, man. It's... And they're awake. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Is this on? This is on. Maybe a little, hold it a little closer. He's going to give you Hello more. There. there Hello there. Hello. 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 Can you hear this? Yeah. Good. Or can you hear this? Yeah. Felix, you got yours working? Yes. <laughs> Earth calling Felix. Earth calling Felix. All right, awesome. Well, you guys are sounding great. You're looking awesome. So um, I want to start uh, with Mark because Mark uh, probably was the first of everybody here to be on the on the music charts, at least, with the yes, Raiders. 61. Right. <laughs> Tell us about those early days uh, when you first... Now, you weren't planning to be a musician or a superstar or a singer, were you? you were, what was your planned uh, vocation? Uh, I was going to be a rocket scientist. Rocket scientist, okay. And I found out you had to do a lot of math for that, so... Yeah. So the music thing came easier than math. So you could, could be sitting in the Tesla right now. I got, across. <laughs> it'd be pretty cold. Yeah. So you you got into the into the Raiders. How did that work? How did that uh, happen for you? Uh, well, I, I won a talent show, so I left home at 15, figuring it would be very easy, and uh, hooked up with Raiders. Uh, actually, it was a group called the De well, it was, there was no name. There was no name, just a bunch of guys, and then we became the Downbeats, and then we became the Raiders, and then the rest, as they say, is history. But it was like an overnight success in about, oh, seven years. <laughs> yeah, most fans will tell you that, right? And, and even Mickey's career as an actor before that. So tell me about the, the, the moment that it happened for you and the band, and uh, were you guys writing hits and saying, this is gonna be a, this is gonna be the one, and what was your inspiration? We, every, everybody in, in, in the Portland area, in the Northwest, there was a song called Louie Louie. And you had to do that song two or three nights, two or three times a night, or they'd walk out on you. So we got the bright idea of recording Louie Louie, but at the same time that the Kingsman, who was one, another band in Oregon, got the bright idea of recording Louie Louie, when the same studio, same engineer, same microphone, same everything, same week, and recorded Louie Louie. They both came out simultaneously. Their sold 600 copies, ours sold 6,000. And on the strength of that, CBS Records signed us up, so we were on our way. We thought. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a nice version of that song. You guys did a very up-tempo song. Yeah, we, we had the, pretty much the West Coast soda, but then of course when we got on Nick Clark's Where the Action Is, that's when yeah. it really happened. Television was like a precursor to MTV. Everybody saw us at once. Luckily, everybody liked us, and uh, there you go. Who's, whose idea was the uniforms, the, the whole thing? Uh, Revere and I are walking up the street in Portland, Oregon, getting some cleaning done. We walked past this costume shop, and here's these guys in Revolutionary Garb. And I went to some point and said, look, you know, that's the way that uh, the guys used to dress back in the day. We looked at each other and went, yeah! So we went in, rented them for one a concert. Uh, everybody liked them, came back. They said, where's your outfits? So we figured, well, it was like Gorgeous George without the costume. Who, Gorgeous George, you know who Gorgeous George is. They sure probably don't. A wrestler who was very flamboyant. Well, we know. <laughs> so, so we had a choice of wearing feather boa bikinis or uh, the Raider outfits. We decided on the coats. That was a good choice. Now, did you, did you then give them to uh, Gary Puckett in the Union Gap? <laughs> well, well, that was the other side. That was uh, that was the other side of the coin in the Civil War. So uh, uh, I think I think it was just uh, it was kind of a, uh, an era. Sergeant Pepper was out, and it was kind of like, hey, uniforms are cool, you know. So uh, I, I'm not sure how Gary got the idea, but you never know. All right. Well, we'll, we'll ask him. To I didn't license it. I know here. So so tell us uh, about hearing your, your song on the radio. That that must be exhilarating. Are you like driving around waiting for it to happen? What was that? Oh like? yeah. Well, of course, AM radio was the biggest thing, and and I remember I went to. A fortune teller, Revere and I both went to a fortune teller when, in the beginning of the group, 
and we both made a wish. And my wish was to have a record in the top 100. <laughs> I mean, I, that's, that's what I thought I would be a success. And of course, uh, our first record I heard on the radio it was like crazy. And then when the TV thing happened and you started getting the network radio, or every, every town you roll into, you get to hear your, your songs. I mean, it was like heady stuff. It was like, you know, a, better than a dream come true. Awesome, fantastic. Mickey, welcome back for your third Flower Power Cruise. Yeah. I'm, on the, I'm on the monkey's mailing list and I just got an email the other day that says beginning in June you're going to be back on tour with your lifelong friend Mike Nesmith in your first ever national tour as a duo. Can you give us a little information about that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm very excited about it. But first of all, I do want to thank everybody for coming here today and to be in this illustrious uh, crowd. Uh, my mom was such a great fan of you guys. <laughs> really. She loved you guys. How many times have I heard that? Told, she played me my your music. My grandmother really liked you guys. <laughs> she played all your music for me. It was Was really it back on the, the oh, so, <laughs> gramophone? Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Uh, Nez and I got together a couple months ago and just thought, you know, why not? You know, um, We've done just about every other configuration, um, but it's called uh, Monkeys Present, the Mike and Mickey show. Okay. Uh, because as Nez says, uh, it's the remnants of the monkeys. Uh, <clears throat> but I'm looking forward to it. I'm <laughs> well, it's like the grass root. <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, we've always uh, really enjoyed working together. Uh, we have similar tastes and musical tastes and, and com co comedic taste, and uh, so we're looking forward to it. It's going to be, a, I think it'll be a lot of fun. It's only uh, 16, 17 days or something like that, but we'll see what happens after that. Is it, is it tough to get Mike off the farm and get him out to do something? It doesn't seem like he, terribly just, difficult. he just loves to be out of nature. Yep, well, that or in his Tesla. Right. <laughs> that was him! <laughs> uh, it is tough, you know, he, um, it, he, he tends to be sort of a solitary uh, soul and uh, always has been, right from the get-go. Um, and he's all, always been invited uh, into any of the, uh, uh, the monkey endeavors. Um, and sometimes he's chosen to, he's kind of our um, Neil Young. <laughs> okay, I like that. Kind of that. That works, for sure. <laughs> uh, and, and he sometimes chooses to, to, to join it, sometimes not, and it's fine, it's okay. Well, it's going to be fantastic. But this is great because he'll, we'll be doing a lot of um, uh, uh, the stuff that he recorded, of course, uh, with and for the monkeys. And then post stuff, the first national band stuff, and... Uh, you know, it'll it'll be a lot of fun. He and I have a great blend mm -hmm. uh, vocally, always have, and uh, and of course we'll also be doing all the big monkey hits too. You know, of course. Well, you know what would be cool since you have his ear, if you could it's invite him back on a future Flower Power cruise along with you, sell it, make it big. I'll tell him. All right. Yeah. Mickey, I was thinking about you, and I live in Fort Lauderdale. I was thinking about you the other day. I went to a tavern. And, uh, they... Well, <laughs> there was that. No, but here's where I'm getting to. You guys interrupted me. And I actually took a picture. I have it on my phone. I'll show you later. A picture of a, of a IPA called Monkey Boy. Circus Boy. I'm sorry. Circus Boy. Oh, Circus Boy. Circus Boy. Circus Boy. You should beer. license that. Just a minute. I want to call my lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> Circus Boy, so uh, I thought of you immediately. I, I think I posted it on your Facebook page so that all your fans could appreciate it. But, oh, cool. Uh, but anyway, I just thought of you, and that reminds me to ask you about, because before you became a, a, a superstar with Monkey's singer-songwriter, you were actually an actor, and you did a, a lot of presentations, a lot of, and you did a TV show. What made you, well, first tell us about that early life, and then how you transitioned into the Monkey's. Well, the early life is pretty well known. My parents were both in showbiz. Um, and my father was an actor, singer. My mom was an actress. They met doing a play in Hollywood. Uh, so I grew up in this uh, showbiz family, not your typical sort of Hollywood, Beverly Hills uh, type uh, uh, showbiz family. 
uh, you know, eyes and teeth, honey, eyes and teeth. Uh, it was uh, really much more down to earth. We lived on a ranch in the valley and had horses and, you know, stuff. So, uh, the, uh, the business, I basically, I followed in my father's footsteps. My first screen test, I was six, I think, for a movie that actually never got made. But, um, and then the circus boy when I was 10. I actually have uh, some prenatal work coming out on ultrasound. <laughs> That's gonna be nice. Yeah, it's good. Can it's black it and out? white, but it's still kind of. Um, so yeah, I grew up in the business. I thought everybody's uh, father was an actor. I hadn't. You know. And then Circus Boy came along from his agent, my dad's agent, just informally said, "Do you want to go to a?" audition and I've been to a couple and I was like yeah okay maybe not I got a baseball game I'm you know I almost didn't go and then of course that did change my life that was probably the biggest life-changing thing to do circus boy and then uh, after that I didn't do anything in the business for uh, years uh, until uh, the monkey audition and that was just again by almost coincidence I was I was studying to be an architect as a matter of fact. See, we had a, a panel about that yesterday, about what our stars might have been. So you think there was a chance that you would have been? Oh, I was in, in a, a college doing architecture uh, for a couple of years. Uh, and, uh, but I was also, you know, on the, in the summer break, I would, you know, do a guest shot on these, low, you know, the, uh, uh, the TV shows like Mr. Novak and Peyton Place and, and you know, uh, TV, and it was mainly just to make money. I was going to be an architect, and if I couldn't make it as an architect, I was going to fall back on show business. <laughs> it's true. But in the back of your mind, you must have loved music because you were there listening to the Beatles on, a, on watching them on Ed Sullivan on a little black and white TV on top of a band. I mean, you were really tuned in to pop culture and the British invasion and what was happening, right? Everybody that I knew was in a band. <laughs> Mine was Mickey and the One Nighters. <laughs> oh! Because it was one night. <laughs> I was, I was, no, it was a cover band like everybody, like the Beatles started uh, out as a cover band. Um, uh, it, it was, I did, uh, I had a couple of bands, one called The Missing Links, believe it or not. This is pre-monkeys. Uh, yeah, because I was, I could sing and, and I would go around town and play uh, and sing in uh, the local, uh, uh, you know, open mic night, you know, kind of thing. And that's where the producers of the of the monkeys actually came and saw me singing Johnny Be Good, which ended up being my audition piece for the monkeys. Uh, and yeah, when that uh, that year '65, uh, there were at least three or four uh, television shows that were focused on on uh, the contemporary pop rock music world. It was in the air, you know there was one that I was up for, that I auditioned for, uh, uh, about a Peter, Paul, and Mary kind of folk group. It actually got piloted, uh, didn't sell, but it was called The Happeners, and uh, it actually did go to pilot, but didn't sell. Another one was like a Beach Boy kind of surfing band thing. Uh, I don't remember the name of it. It did not go to pilot, I was up for that. And another one was like the New Christy Menstrual Big Family Mighty Wind you know, kind of, <clears throat> uh, uh, group. Uh, it did not go to pilot, but then, then there was the monkeys. And I even then remember thinking, this is different. This is very, very different. Did you think and it was an acting job or a singing job? Well, it was both. You had to be able to act, sing, and play an instrument. That was from the get-go. <clears throat> Excuse me, even to get into the auditions. Uh, that was very clear. How did David get in the band? Tambourine. He was already signed to Screen Gems. <laughs> um, oh, the tambourine. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, no, you had to be able to sing. It, it, it was uh, a, a, a great singer. He'd done Broadway already, you know, uh, Oliver and all that. He was actually on that first Ed Sullivan show with the Beatles. That he night. was. He I don't remember him at all. All I remember is the Beatles. I don't remember him, but um, uh, yeah. But you had to be able to sing and play and and do comedy and the the auditions were uh, now in retrospect 
a lot like you would audition for a musical, for a musical theater on Broadway. Uh, you have to have all those skills. Um, have dancing? Well, yeah, a little bit. I mean, there was, there was, you know, movement. You had to be able to be funny. You had to be able to act. But do scenes. Scene study was one of the auditions. And this isn't like American Idol kind of, you know, thing. This was at two o'clock in the afternoon on a sound stage. I've, I've seen the line around the building. Were those people that had a yeah. reservation, or did you have you had an invite, right? No, I'd already had a series. So one had, when one has one's own series, one one does not go to the cattle call. One has a private audition with a producer. So. No, I. I uh, you know, I'd already had a bit of a name from being a kid. Same studio, same office. You know, when I did show up for the monkeys, the it was the same guard at the gate. <laughs> so, hey, Mickey, how you doing? Oh, you're back. Okay. Um, so, uh, it, but it was you know, the monkeys essentially was uh, Marx Brothers musical on television. Yep. Uh, for half an hour. I think that, that even the Beatles called you that. They yes, it. It, yeah, it was John that, you know, and, and he was absolutely right. I like them, they like the Marx Brothers. It was much more about the Marx Brothers than the Beatles. First of all, we were not famous, and we never were famous on the TV show. It was this struggle for success, trying to be the Beatles. That's what the show was about, about this band that wanted to be the Beatles. And we had a poster of the Beatles in the on the set in, in the, that uh, Malibu beach house, which does beg the question: How could we afford a Malibu <laughs> beach house when we never got any work, <laughs> and we would throw darts at it? <laughs> Uh, but that's what the, the show was about, and that's what the monkeys was about. Well, Sonny Crockett drove a Ferrari Testarossa on 22.5 a year in Miami, so <laughs> same kind of thing. So I, I know I'm jumping ahead here, but is it? Did you actually? Did I hear this? Did you actually audition for the role of Fonzie? Is that true? It was down to me and Henry. It was down to you and Henry. And Henry yeah, yeah. yeah. And he tells the story. We became good friends uh, uh, later. He tells the story of going into the callback for the final. You know, I guess audition and it was me and him and he walks in and he saw me and he said ah oh, shit I'll never get this <laughs> uh, but he was perfect obviously you know he was the Fonz uh, I, I would I would have been trying to pretend I was a, a East Coast motorcycle kind of you know uh, guy he was the Fonz and he was wonderful in the part of the first. We obviously know that the monkeys had terrific success, but do you remember the moment when you heard uh, um, uh, Last Night in Clarksville, I guess would be the first single, on the on the radio or something like Mark yeah. was talking about? Can yeah. you give us that, what was happening in your nerves? And your I heart? absolutely remember. Well, I was not uh, au fait necessarily with the music industry. Uh, I was an actor and I, could, and I was a singer and I did live stuff, but I didn't actually know that much about the radio uh, record company, you know, whole thing. Tommy Boyce actually said to me years ago, uh, he said, I don't know if you remember, but I, I came up to you one day and I said, You're, you have three, three uh, songs in the top ten in Cashbox. And I said, what's Cashbox? <laughs> I had no idea. Uh, I do remember the first time I heard uh, Clarksville. Uh, Davey and I uh, were uh, co-renting a, uh, a house in, in, uh, in L.A. Uh, in the early days and shooting the show every day and, you know, coming. And we were driving, we'd heard that the song was going to be uh, premiered on KHJ at the time. Yeah, and a <clears throat> big station, an uh, AM station uh, at the time, like Mark was saying, it was all about AM radio. King. Yeah. And we're driving home, we just had pulled up in front of the house and it came on the radio, and we just looked at each other and beamed, you know, it was just like, oh my goodness. That was the first time I heard a, uh, I heard one of the songs on the radio, because we were ensconced in the, on the set every day, 10, 12 hours a day. We didn't get out much sequestered, you know. That. Let's talk to Felix Cavallari, my buddy over here. <laughs> Thank you.
twenty percent. You're amazing. And uh, tell tell me uh, your. I, and I was watching you on the All Access Pass with Jason, and you were talking about your classical influences. But when did it transition to rock and roll, or even almost? I don't know if you called Joey Dean doo but certainly pre rock and roll music, right? Tell me about that period. You know, I want to ask Vicky a question. Oh, go, yeah, question. right ahead, Phyllis. You know, we heard this story years ago that, that you built a, 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 a helicopter in a room. And then you, when you built it, it was all together. You couldn't get it out because the door was too small. <laughs> <laughs> the urban myth. Uh, and you don't know the helicopter. I always wanted to ask if you built a, you know. I did build, it was a gyrocopter, a gyrocopter yeah. which is slightly different. But you than could get it out of the building. Yeah, of course. I, you, don't build, you don't build a gyrocopter. You know, sometimes you, know, you have this not be able to get it out the door. News that you can't believe. Anyway, I, I believe. I did have to take the doors off. I thought so. But I had planned all that. I mean, that's pretty simple. Yeah, I'm stuff. sorry about that. Excuse me, now what was, the, what was my name? Well, I was going to say, I guess you can strike that paragraph from the book. Okay. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm beginning to rock and roll. Here's what happened to me. I'm a young, young fella uh, who my mom uh, wanted me to be a classical musician. So uh, I said, well, okay, I'll tell you what, I'd rather play baseball. However, I wasn't really that good at baseball, but, but I was good at playing the piano. So when I hit junior high, there was this gentleman in front of me, I use the word loosely, who became one of my best friends, and he turned around to me and he said, do you like rock and roll? I had never heard of rock and roll, but I said yes, because, you know, come on, you got to be cool in seventh grade, right? So I uh, immediately went home that evening, and I turned out, we had the good fortune in New York City of having Alan Freed. See, Alan Freed brought the, uh, uh, brought, brought the rock and roll idiom to, uh, to WINS. So I heard the very beginning of what we call, you know, American popular music now, which was phenomenal. And still is. And I guess that's why all you people are here, right? Because you got bitten by the same book. So in American Rock and Roll, what, what type of song was it that you heard then? Well, I heard people like uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, Fats Domino, uh, you know, Smokey Robinson, Marvin Gaye. Uh, you know, I was a piano player. I heard Ray Charles playing piano. I said, what is this? This is like so cool. And, and it really uh, it was like epiphany. I mean, I just, I really said, well, I can do this. I can play it, you know, and uh, that's really what started. And then how did you put that in action? What did you do? Well, what happened basically is there was a band uh, on the, on the, in, this, in the school that was doing like weddings and bar mitzvahs and things like that and private parties. And they needed a piano player. So I went. And, uh, did you have a private audition, or did you have to go? <laughs> they kidnapped me. What happened? <laughs> and uh, what happened basically is that you know now this is as as the music was evolving, or you know to uh, I guess rock and roll. So in this middle of our show, I would do my little piece. You know, I'd do my little kind of like, come on over, baby, whole lot of shaking going on. Next thing I find out. Everybody's asking for that part of the show now. See, so we went from da 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 And then the magic of the the hit machine started when you joined the Rascals or you formed the Rascals with Eddie, is that right? Yeah, basically what happened is, you know, we had this lovely thing in those days called the draft. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I left school, I was in pre-med at Syracuse and I had a band up there and uh, I decided uh, one summer to go to work in the Catskill Mountains. How many of you remember the Catskill Mountains? <laughs> Now you gotta understand this, I'm making $60 a week room and board. I thought I had died and gone to heaven. <laughs> I loved it. Oh man, it was like, you know, I'm like, Mick, I, I was not brought up with show business. You know, my dad was a dentist, my mom was a pharmacist, you know, and uh, I said it at the thing the other day, you know, like my, when my dad was approached years later, he said, uh, do you know how much soul your son has? And my dad says, my souls are right here on my feet. <laughs> so, 
So basically, I just loved it, and, and, and I, I really wanted to have an opportunity to uh, give it a try. And I was fortunate enough that my father, uh, he acquiesced, he said, like, take a year and see if you can make it. Yeah, right, okay. But I got, I got permission to leave. Well, unfortunately, when I left, now the United States is uh, knocking on your door. So uh, I waited until they decided that I was not the right material. <laughs> Excuse me, really? So, so well, what do you mean by that? And they said, well, we'll call you. If anybody attacks, we may need you. <laughs> Other than that, you know. So, then I started the band. I started the Rascals. I asked a bunch of fellows who basically were backing up uh, Joey D, uh, uh, if they would like to go out and try it on our own. Interestingly enough, the drummer that we had said, nah, I don't want to do it, I'm going to join a local group. But this lady that I was seeing told me about this drummer. You know, and I, I've said this story before, but she was a bank teller. So when I asked her, what do you think of our band? She said, eh. I said, what do you mean, ah? <laughs> what do you know? You know dollars and bills. She said, well, I know a drummer. And she took me to the Metropole in New York City, and I saw this fellow by the name of Dino Donnelly. Forget. Forget. I saw this guy. He was not only, he was not only playing drum, but he was my waiter did that the other night at the Martini Bar. Was that him? <laughs> well, unfortunately, not everybody you know, can make a living these days. But anyway, he uh, became one of the rascals. And, and seriously, we had, we had a deal in six months. Nice. Six months from the inception. Wow. Yeah. I'm proud of it. And then I asked Mark and asked Mickey, where were you when, well, I know uh, not going to eat a any my heart anymore was a right. single, but that good love and hit number one. Where were you when that happened, and what was your Actually, experience? we were in California. We went out there to the Whiskey of Go-Go. You guys remember the whiskey? See, because we, uh, we had to, in those days, you had to unite the country, just like today, to unite the country for a hit. In other words, you have a hit on the East Coast, that's okay, but you also have to have it on the West Coast. So we went out there and played the whiskey, and that, that's when it hit number one. I remember the whiskey. I spent two years there one night. <laughs> Oh, uh, you guys, let me tell you something. If, if any of you ever saw California in the 60s, let me tell you. Let me tell you, Los Angeles was berserk. Yep. I mean, you know, they, they, you know, they were dancing by themselves in the street, just spinning around. And it was like, do you remember the, that, what was that place they had? The, uh, I don't remember the clubs. They, it was like, you know, when my, the trip, the club was called the trip. It was. And so seriously, one night we had guys come in, like we had Superman come in one night. You know, to, you know, they come in and they try to put the pin on him. He said, oh, this is Krypton, you can't put it on him. <laughs> California, man, let me tell you, you guys were pretty nuts out there. <laughs> Fantastic stuff. It was great for guys from New York and New Jersey. You know, what the hell was going on, you know? But it was you fun. Want to get to you, because you, you were... The younger, younger of the people in, in that day and age that were trying to get into music, you were hanging around older guys, Liverpool, I'm giving you the, the young guy situation, Liverpool, Manchester, London, what, what was it like for, to be the young guy to try to get into the music business and was that your goal? It was actually a, re a really good position to be in because I was very, um, um, I was kind of, insin I was insistent. You were and, like 15, so, right? So, and luckily I was friends with with a lot of people in bands that had made it in, in different levels, you know, like I knew Johnny Kidd and the Pirates and, and some of that period and I, obviously I knew all the Liverpool guys because I was in that scene and, and in those days um, it was good to have friends, you know, I couldn't get Brian Epstein to manage me because he had Tommy Quickly who was better than me. So. Um, I, I hung around, you know, and basically, in those days, you needed a job if you wanted to be a musician. So everybody in Herman's Hermits um, w had a job so that they could play at night because there was not enough money for a new band to live. So I was a window cleaner, and Eric Burden was a window cleaner, and uh, Eric Burden was so good that he could jump the ladder. <laughs> You know, I, I had to go like up the ladder, clean the windows, go down the ladder, and then get move it along a bit, and then get through those, and then they go up the ladder, and he could 
he was a little fella as well. He was a little midget kind of guy. <laughs> and he could go... Oh, he'd just go to the next ladder. And just move it over. Shit, how do you do that, man? <laughs> You, you, when you've been working here for 20 years, you will do that, you fuck bloody kids. <laughs> you know, he's always a gr he was always a grumpy old man, but I knew all these people. And he was a grumpy old man when he was 18. <laughs> I think it's, it's, you and Van Morrison, like, own the grumpy old man forever. <laughs> you know, I told Van this, but I said, did you hear that joke? Oh, somebody's, that's my phone talking to me, excuse me. So I said, I said, you know, it's a joke. I wrote a joke and I said, isn't it interesting how so many people name their children after the place they were conceived, like Paris, Hilton, <laughs> and Athens, and Brooklyn, this one, and Van Morrison. <laughs> he didn't laugh. What kind of a joke is that? What kind of a joke is that? I think it's a very good one. I mean, it just has to be, have your name in it. So we all worked hard. I was a window cleaner and I sold newspapers and everything so that we could play. And we, we got lucky because we, we got to play. They had a thing at the cabin called the Junior Cabin where, you know, 12, 30, in, in those days, 12 or 13 year old people were safe to go out on their own in, in a club. There were no drugs. The guy at the door was, was new. Better than cops would have local like wrestlers on the door because they could spot trouble before it got inside. And and so we played this cabin thing, and it was you know it was the Mersey Beats and the Escorts and the, and the Undertakers, people who people who appealed to a younger audience really. Than, and and in, in the evening it would. Um, our dream was that if we can ever play to like the older people at the cabin. How do we do that? So everybody was unique and different. The Undertakers weren't like the Mersey Beats and the Mersey Beats weren't like the Stones and everyone was different and everyone was trying to find a little pocket. And, and Peter Asher said it in 